So let's chat about the EM spec, the electromagnetic spectrum. It's a continuous spectrum of all electromagnetic radiation. In this video, I'm going to show you how to master everything you need to know about the electromagnetic spectrum. And we're going to start by something that you probably are familiar with, the idea of a rainbow. <laughs> Don't forget to subscribe and hit the notifications button because this is Gorilla Physics and other channels show you the content, but I'm going to show you how to get a grade 9 in physics. Before we go on to the wider electromagnetic spectrum, you should definitely know the colours of the rainbow in order. That's red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo and violet. Richard of York gave battle in vain is how we remember that. What you perhaps didn't know, which is crucial for understanding the rest of this, is that red light is lower energy than purple light is. The key pattern in the electromagnetic spectrum is that the higher the frequency, the light, the higher the energy. Remember, we can only see a small portion of the electromagnetic spectrum, but we know the rest is there because we can detect it. And because of each portion's properties, their frequency or their wavelength, we have different uses for them. You might be able to name the colours of the rainbow and you might get them wrong, but let's have a look. It's red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo and violet. Richard of York gave battle in vain. So that's just the part of the electromagnetic spectrum that we can see. That is just the visible part. Now it was discovered a reasonably long time ago that if you put a thermometer just to the side of the red part of the visible spectrum, that thermometer shows an increase in temperature. And that is because there's another type of wave that is invisible that we can detect with thermometers. And that was infrared. Now infrared is the type of wave that carries heat. It's the type of wave that all hot objects emit. So we can only see this small portion of the electromagnetic spectrum, but we have things that can detect all of the other portions. Essentially, it's a continuous spectrum with increasing energy towards the ionizing portion. And the ionizing portion is ultraviolet, x-rays and gamma rays. They are the dangerous ones. Ionizing means to change the structure of an atom, basically to remove electrons from atoms. And that leaves behind an ion and that can cause DNA mutations and possibly cancer. So some of the electromagnetic spectrum can be dangerous. The key point that you need to bear in mind about the electromagnetic spectrum is they're all exactly the same apart from the frequency and the wavelength. So they all have the exact same speed. It's all three times 10 to the eight meters per second in a vacuum. They all have the exact same speed, which means that if you double the frequency, you half the wavelength. That is an application of the wave speed equation. So the electromagnetic spectrum is really important that you know it in order. These are all jumbled up, so you could pause the video right now and actually have a go at putting them in order. I think it's a really important idea for you to have yourself a poster sized or a double page spread of all of the electromagnetic spectrum in the right order with some of the details around it. So let's put them in the right order now. Here we are, we've got the longest wavelength end, the radio waves end and the shortest wavelength end, the gamma rays end. Get them all in order and then try and put on the highest and lowest frequency and also try and put on the highest energy. And think about it like this, the higher the frequency, the higher the energy of the electromagnetic radiation. Also label in the middle there of the visible light, the end which is red and the end which is the purple end or the violet end. Richard of York gave battle in vain or some people like to remember Roy G. Biv, that works for some people, but they, that is the colors of the visible spectrum, the colors of the rainbow in order. Remember this is all an application of the wave speed equation which says that the speed of light is fixed in any given medium, so the frequency and the wavelength are inversely proportional to each other. The speed of light is always three times 10 to the eight. Frequency and wavelength is our inverse one another so if you double the frequency you half the wavelength here they are in order with the frequencies and with the energies labeled on and with the colors in the right direction so now i suggest that you actually use your own research to try and find out for these all of these these different things uh, name of the portion of the spectrum any safety notes and a use of that portion you could even go into finding sources of those types of radiation and things which can detect them and that will really help you build up a kind of knowledge of this electromagnetic spectrum to be able to use in the exams i'm going to go through some of the portions and some of their properties and uses now so let's talk about the high energy end, the ionizing portion. The ionizing portion is sort of somewhere in the middle of the ultraviolet. So some ultraviolet rays are non-ionizing and some are ionizing and all the way up to gamma rays. So if we were to label that portion, then it would be this last portion here, the ultraviolet to X-ray portion. 
Now let's talk about frequencies and wavelengths. Because they are short wavelength and because they are high frequency, they are ionizing, and that means they have the most energy so it can do the most damage. What they can do is they can ionize atoms and potentially kill cells, but they can also cause DNA mutations which can lead to cancer. The difference between an X-ray and a gamma ray is not so much about the frequency or the wavelength, it's actually about where it comes from. X-rays are from changes in electron energy and gamma rays are from the nucleus of atoms. They are nuclear radiation. So nuclear physics is coming later. So again, and this is a hard challenge. If you're up for a challenge, then pause the video now because these are scrambled. These are the frequencies and wavelengths of each portion, but they are not in the right place. So if you fancy this, pause this now and try and put them in the right order. So you know the radio waves end are the longest wavelengths and the, sh the gamma rays ends are the shortest wavelengths and the radio waves are the lowest frequencies and the gamma rays are the highest frequencies. So all you need to do is use the powers of 10 there to put them in the right order, which is quite a challenge. Here they are though. Um, so it ranges right from radio waves, which have wavelengths of kilometers, all the way down to gamma rays, which have wavelengths in 10 to the minus 15. The visible light is right in the middle, and that is 10 to the minus seven meters. We talk about visible light as having hundreds of nanometer wavelengths. So that is a nanometer is times 10 to the minus nine. So get your wavelengths in order. You don't need to remember them, but you do need to understand that the electromagnetic spectrum can be divided into these portions, but even within those portions, there's a range of different wavelengths and a range of different frequencies that correspond to them. It is not the case that ultraviolet is always exactly the same wavelength, that X-rays are all exactly the same wavelength, for example. There's a range of different um, colors of those lights in that. And actually the visible light, all the different colors are, is different frequencies or different wavelengths of electromagnetic radiation. Similarly with the frequencies, it goes right from 10 to the 5 hertz, so that's like tens of thousands of oscillations per second, all the way up to 10 to the 24 hertz, so the highest energy gamma radiation end. Visible light is 10 to the 14 hertz, so 10 to the 14 oscillations every single second. That's like 100 trillion waves every second. I mean, these, that, and that's only the middle of the electromagnetic spectrum. So this slide's just here to help you write comparisons, show you how you should write comparisons about the different portions of the EM spec. And you should write comparisons based on frequencies and or wavelengths. That's the type of thing the examiner's looking out for. So why do we use microwaves to communicate with satellites rather than radio waves? Well, that's because radio waves don't penetrate the upper atmosphere. And this is because microwaves have a higher frequency or they have a shorter wavelength. X-rays, gamma rays and ultraviolet can ionize atoms and lead to mutations, which can cause cancer, but visible light can't do that. This is because visible light has a longer wavelength or a lower frequency. The point I'm trying to make here is that the, these questions, if they gave you this type, would not be about what the actual properties were, but the properties based on the frequencies or the wavelengths. All of the different portions, the only difference between them is the frequency or the wavelength. So all of the uses that we find for each of them is because of the frequency or the wavelength. So this is a use of gamma rays in industry. You're welcome to pause and have a little read of it. But basically gamma rays can be used in industry as a tracer. So you can inject a small amount of a radioisotope which emits gamma rays and you can therefore find leaks um, in pipe work or you know, in underground pipes so that you don't have to dig them up or you don't have to dismantle the whole machine to find where the leak is. It's a really useful thing. X-rays and gamma rays are also used in medicine, X-rays are used in X-ray scanners, X-rays are also used in CT scans, and also gamma rays are used as tracers in the human body. So a radioisotope which emits gamma can be used as a tracer for the human body to analyze the circulation in the human body. So we inject a patient with usually technetium-99, which has a short enough half-life so they're not radioactive later, but a long enough half-life so that they are radioactive for long enough to take the scan. So half-lives are coming in a different video. So here's three questions and feel free to pause the video and have a little go at those. And here's three answers. Remember, if you double the frequency, you half the wavelength. And this is because the wave speed is fixed in any given medium. The highest energy portion of electromagnetic spectrum is gamma and it's ionizing so it can cause mutations and could possibly lead to cancer. So it can also kill cells. Another thing you could said about one danger of being exposed to that. So exposure to radiation can also kill cells and, and that's why one reason it could be bad. So we're just rolling out a brand new 5G network across our country and um, people might be worried that having higher frequencies would mean that it was less safe but we're still that's still in the radio wave portion of the spectrum so there's no more danger of using 5g as opposed to good old 4g or even 3g it's still non-ionizing radiation the only part of the electromagnetic spectrum that is actually dangerous is the ionizing portion 
Ultraviolet light can be used in forensics because it causes fluorescence. You've probably seen this at some point. Ultraviolet light, when it shines on other things, can make them give out light. Those things absorb the ultraviolet and give out visible light. It's important to understand that you aren't seeing the ultraviolet. You're seeing the visible light given out by the object as it absorbs infrared and then re-emits visible light. There's different types of UV. There's UVA and there's UVB. And there's this thing called a sun protection factor that we have in sun creams. A sun protection factor is the multiplier that that sun cream would give to your normal length of time that you could spend exposed to ultraviolet without being sunburned. So basically, if you were to go into the sunlight and burn in 15 minutes, if you were wore an SPF 10, then you'd be able to be in the sunlight for 150 minutes before burning. And UVA is actually the longer wavelength uh, form of ultraviolet. So that is ones that don't cause skin cancer, they don't cause, cause sunburns, but they do cause aging of the skin. UVB is actually the shorter wavelength, higher frequency, so higher energy therefore, which is ionizing, which can cause sunburns, which can cause skin cancer. Now UVA can and B can also cause damage to your eyes. A high intensity UV light can cause damage to your eyes. So we often wear sunglasses and they're not just to look cool, it is also to protect our eyes. So infrared is thermal energy transfer by radiation basically. Infrared is a bit more red than red, it's in from red, it's infrared. It's a longer wavelength form of red light. It's the type of electromagnetic radiation that carries heat. So hot objects emit infrared light. They emit more infrared light. And for example, that's how a grill works. There's no contact, there's no conduction or convection involved in heating with a grill. There is just transmission of heat by infrared. We also use it for communication. We use it for uh, remote controls. So actually you can't see the little LED going off on a remote control, but the camera can. And here's another bit of information you should pay attention to with the EM spec. We can't see them all, but we can detect them all. So we can only see this very small part, but we have evidence for all of the other portions of the EM spec. So here I've just got a few comparisons between the uses of ultraviolet and infrared. On the left here, this is ultraviolet being used for a sun tanning bed. And on the right is infrared being used for space heating, so room heating basically. That is actually a sauna, which they are heating with some infrared light bulbs. So in forensics, they can use ultraviolet to illuminate and make fluoresce objects they wouldn't otherwise see. And they can also use infrared with an infrared camera to be able to see people uh, within buildings or through opaque objects. And you can see in this thermogram, you can see the hottest area is this person's face um, because that is giving out the most heat. So there's the most infrared being emitted from that person's face. We also use ultraviolet and infrared to observe our universe. So on the left hand side there is a galaxy in the infrared portion. So you're looking at the infrared light um, emitted from this galaxy here. And on the right hand side is actually Saturn, but it's Saturn in ultraviolet. So you're actually seeing a lot of the ultraviolet light that's being given off as all those gases orbit inside Saturn. You're looking at the emission of ultraviolet from Saturn. We've looked at all of the EM specs so far, apart from the region used for communication. So let's have a look in a bit more detail at this low energy end that is used for communication. It's the lowest frequency, it's the highest wavelength, so it's the least dangerous. So we use them as carrier wave signals. So essentially a carrier wave carries on it a signal, which is the data that we want to actually transmit. So these three regions, infrared, microwaves and radio waves, they're actually rather large. I'm going to look in detail at each portion. So around about 930 nanometers, that is the range of infrared that we actually use for remote controls. So remote controls have a little IR blaster and whatever you're trying to control has an IR receiver. And it's roughly 930 nanometers, which is the wavelengths that we use for that. All hot objects give out infrared radiation and that's slightly longer wavelength, that's 10, roughly 10 micrometers is the thermal radiation range. Microwaves, well, around about 10 centimeter microwaves is used for cooking and that's because that's the specific wavelength which actually causes water to vibrate and we'll talk about that a bit later. But greater than 10 centimeters, that's the range of microwaves that we use for communication. Around about two millimeter microwaves are what we call the cosmic microwave background radiation. So it's not one that we particularly use, but every Every single part of the universe emits the same wavelength of radiation and that is really strong evidence for Big Bang Theory. So different parts of this communication portion of the spectrum have different uses depending on their frequencies and depending on really their interaction with our atmosphere. Now we call this type of wave sky waves between 3 and 30 megahertz. They are called sky waves because what they actually do is they reflect 
from our atmosphere and from planet Earth as well. And so they can actually be reflected around the curvature of the Earth. That's how we can have radio wave signals that go across whole oceans and we can be reflected all the way around our Earth essentially. So they're very useful because they reflect and because they refract in our upper atmosphere as well, they can be useful for transmitting long distances on planet Earth. But they don't penetrate through the atmosphere, so they're no good for communicating to and from satellites. So we use space waves, which are the region between 30 and 300 megahertz. And we call them space waves because they do penetrate through the atmosphere. They are transmitted through the atmosphere. So they're very useful for communicating to and from satellites in space. The last ones, well, these are actually the type of waves that are absorbed by our atmosphere. So they're only very useful for short distances on Earth and they're between 300 megahertz and 300 gigahertz. So they don't get very far even within Earth's atmosphere. So they're used for short distance communication here on Earth. So let's look at the radio wave portion in detail then. And the bands actually mean that different devices can communicate in different frequencies and not interfere with each other. And that's really, really important. So the 5G portion of the spectrum, which we actually use for communicating with mobile phones for very high data transfer rates is around about three gigahertz. Okay, that is the frequency of phones that are communicating on the 5G portion. About around about two gigahertz, that is your Wi-Fi router and your phone when it's logged onto Wi-Fi is using that frequency to communicate. And 4G is actually one gigahertz. So there's no real importance about the different frequencies apart from the fact that if we were broadcasting on the same frequency, we'd get a lot of interference between them. DAB radio, so digital radio is around about the 200 megahertz frequency. FM radio is slightly longer wavelength now. Uh, lower frequency is 100 megahertz. So FM is used usually for music because you can have quite high fidelity music broadcast in that frequency. Medium wave and all the way down to a long wave, which is very good for very long distances, uh, getting around the curvature of the earth and actually diffracting through and around objects like buildings or hills. That's a very good frequency for broadcasting audio data over long distances. You need to know a little bit about how radio waves and microwaves are produced and they're produced by causing electrons to oscillate, so basically to vibrate. So you can put an alternating potential difference across any conductor and you cause the electrons to oscillate, to vibrate backwards and forwards essentially. And whatever frequency you alternate that potential difference, so you can see that I put positives and negatives on either side of this conductor here, the metal ions are the kind of gray ones and the electrons are the blue ones. And as those electrons oscillate backwards and forwards at whatever frequency they're oscillating, they will produce a radio wave or a microwave at that frequency. So you can see the waves being given off in all different directions. So if you make electrons oscillate within a conductor using an alternating current, you will produce radio waves at that frequency. Now detecting them is the same but opposite. So the radio waves actually cause the electrons to oscillate at the same frequency as them as well. So an antennae, aerial like the one we've got here on the left hand side, a radio wave uh, dish like this, or indeed the receivers on this that are communicating with satellites, they all work by just having the radio waves or microwaves causing electrons to oscillate at a particular frequency, hence we've got a signal. We can detect that AC signal that's produced by that. And lastly, uh, with the AM spec, I just wanna talk about cooking with microwaves. This is a picture of a magnet magnetron inside a microwave oven and a magnetron is something that produces microwaves. It produces microwaves in exactly the same way by having an alternating potential difference causing electrons to oscillate at exactly the right frequency to produce 10 centimeter microwaves and 10 centimeter microwaves are just the right wavelength to cause water to vibrate. So if you get water vibrating, then it's essentially gonna get hot and that's gonna cook the food. There's a little question down there, let's do this one quickly. Calculate the frequency of microwaves given the speed of light in a vacuum is three times 10 to the eight. As with every calculation ever, we're gonna start by writing down the equation we're gonna use, that's the wave speed equation. Wave speed is frequency times wavelength. Then we just need to identify our data. We've been given a wavelength this time, 10 centimeters. Now that is not in correct SI units, so I'm gonna convert that before I do anything else. 0.1 meters, that is the SI unit for any length. And we also know the wave speed, which is three times 10 to the eight meters per second. And here was the clue that you needed to use meters because that's in meters. Now you can substitute into the equation. And you want to note the frequency, so we just leave an F there. Rearrange for F by just doing the inverse operation. I've got times by, and that becomes divide by. So now we just reach for the calculator, making sure we can use our times 10 to the button, which is three times 10 to the nine. There's nine zeros there. And we're calculating a frequency, so our unit is Hertz. That's the most important equation, the wave speed equation. You can actually measure the wavelength of microwaves using your microwave oven. The microwave oven essentially sets up a 10 centimeter microwave standing wave and there's a rotating plate that actually rotates the food through that wave causing it to heat 
evenly. So if you put in a plate of grated chocolate or grated cheese, if you just give it a few short blasts without the rotator plate in, 10 seconds at a time, you will actually see spots of cooked, followed by uncooked, followed by cooked, followed by uncooked, and those cooked spots will be 10 centimeters apart, or roughly 10 centimeters. You can measure that to verify that with a ruler. If that made sense to you, just say yes sir in the comments, and I'll see you on my channel at gorillaphysics.com as well for more videos. Hope that was useful, let me know by hitting the like button.